Okay, I'm going to start with a bit of history and uh, the idea that ontologies have been developed since Aristotle, but all of the debates have been continuing and are still continuing, and there's a huge amount of problems of mapping these things to and from ordinary languages, mapping them to and from all the computers that uh, we have, the computer systems, uh, including the legacy systems, which are the most important because we have trillions of dollars of legacy software that will never go away, and all of these things must be considered. Now, the patterns of ontology must be represented in and mapped to ordinary languages and to our computer systems. Uh, the problem is that we need to have language and ontology represented and mapping to and from our ordinary languages. Those are the things, those are the systems that people use for talking and thinking and writing, and any discrepancy between the way they think and the way they, uh, the uh, ontologies are defined is going to imply that the ontologies are irrelevant unless there is a, unless the people think in terms the same terms as your ontology, they won't enter the data correctly, they won't use the systems correctly, and uh, the ontology will be irrelevant. And finally, the point about the uh, interoperability is that the interoperability has to be based on ordinary language, because ordinary language is what everybody has used to define all of our legacy systems, and when you have independently developed software, the ontology is almost irrelevant unless it has an accurate mapping to and from the natural languages. This creates an immense amount of problems, and it has created problems uh, for as long as people have been entering data into computer systems. And I do not believe that having a formal ontology will magically cause these problems to go away. Uh, a bit of history on uh, the development of some of the most fundamental concepts, and the one that uh, I believe is really the most fundamental is the one by Heraclitus, which he uh, distinguished as logos and physis. Now, logos in Greek, or physis can best be translated as nature, but logos means a lot of related topics, including language, word, logic, reasoning, reckoning. All those are all integrated in one word, logos. And the interesting thing is that it's considered to be similar to uh, what the, the distinction by uh, Gautama Buddha between Dharma and Maya, and by Lao Tzu in China, uh, in, in Tao, or the way, and significantly, uh, Heraclitus, Buddha, Gautama Buddha, and Lao Tzu all lived around the same time, around 500 BC, and they were all talking about these same things, or writing about these same things, and the uh, uh, Silk Road that goes from uh, uh, Greece to uh, China uh, passes through India and or passes their the groups that they go through India. And all of these concepts and all of these ideas were probably being shared by the uh, travelers who went to, along the way. So this is probably not an accidental distinction. Significantly, about uh, 500 years later, uh, Heraclitus and John the uh, Evangelist that all things panta, all things in Greek, panta, come to be according to or through the logo. And uh, when the New, the New Testament has been translated to Chinese, they in, uh, translate logos as Tao. And Plato used these same distinctions, Aristotle built on them and changed them, and uh, all throughout history, these distinctions have been culturally and uh, universal, and I believe that this is fundamental to any kind of ontology. Now, modern ontology, uh, philosophers have been debating these things, and the debates, debates continue. And one of the points that uh, I have maintained is that we need a version that is as neutral as possible among all the various debates. And there are these technical terms that are defined in logic, but people still talk, write, and think in the natural languages, and if those terms don't have a smooth mapping to and from the languages they speak, the uh, formal system is what will be ignored. And this is a serious problem. It has been and will be. Prospects for a universal ontology? Well, uh, there's still no consensus. Uh, from the fourth century BC, 
you have Aristotle's categories and syllogisms, which have been the main version of ontology and logic that people have used for over 2,000 years. And in the uh, 12th, uh, 13th, 16th century, the scholastic logicians really integrated this system in quite a sophisticated <laughs> way. Uh, unfortunately, when the Renaissance came, there was a lot of people that complained about the logic chopping of the uh, scholastics. And so logic went down. The developments of logic and ontology went down with the uh, uh, Renaissance. And around the 17th century, new schemes were being developed by Descartes, Nersen, Pascal, Leibniz, Newton, and John Wilkins, and uh, l'Académie Française. A lot of different versions were debated and developed in around the 17th century at the same time that uh, our modern versions of the world of uh, uh, views have been developing. In the 18th century, uh, more schemes, including the satire of the Grand Academy of Legado by uh, Jonathan Swift, who was deliberately uh, criticizing the versions of ontology, especially the version by John Wilkins, which was probably the largest uh, ontology ever developed until the uh, more recent things like Sight. And uh, also 19th century, more work. And the interesting thing is Roger Cisaris, which is based on language, is far and away more successful than any of the formal systems. It uh, became an instant uh, success, and uh, it's still being used by computer systems and uh, people who are working on computer translations of language and everything else. Uh, in the uh, 20th century, there's all sorts of ontologies by Peirce, Brentano, uh, Meinong, Husserl, Lech, Leshnevsky, Russell, and Whitehead. All of these are, have had a strong influence on the 20th century. And then getting into the 1970s, then we started getting computerized versions of conceptual schema work and all sorts of standards based on that. In, in the 1980s, we had various kinds of ontologies. Computer, the site is the largest one and still going, and they are having now uh, thousands of micro theories and millions of axioms. And WordNet also started, that was a language based version. The Japanese had the G uh, Japanese Electronic Dictionary Research, which was an interesting project, but unfortunately they were charging a lot of money for it. And uh, so WordNet, which was free, <laughs> killed everything else that cost thousands of dollars. And uh, uh, Sites also opened up a, an open site, which is now has some use, but still WordNet is the de facto standard for aligning independently developed ontologies. And it has no formal definitions of any kind. And now the 20th, first century, here we are with various kinds of projects by the IEEE had, uh, there was an, an email list, which sort of came up with Sumo is the best thing they developed, but that's still not universal. There's the DAML project for uh, the semantic web. There's the ICRIS project because the DOD was not happy with DAML. And uh, then there's uh, ISO standards, proposed ISO standards today. Now, my feeling about all these prospects is uh, I do not have a huge uh, degree of faith that any of them will really become universal anytime soon. On the other hand, I believe that the attempt is interesting and worth pursuing. Uh, this is the scholastic meaning triangle. They did not draw a triangle, but uh, Ogden and Richards drew a triangle that was based on it, and they get all the credit for it. But there in the lower left-hand corner is uh, a sign, uh, the letter Yojo, uh, which has a signification in the cloud at the top indicates a, uh, uh, something like a cat, a black cat, which uh, the word the sign signifies. And then the supposition is uh, a supposed animal named Yojo. And the point is that the logicians, that the scholastics emphasize that the uh, supposition might be real, it might be fictional, it might be uh, some kind of abstraction. And one of the things that they were talking about is uh, God and the angels, and they had to make sure that their supposition was general enough to apply to God, the angels, and all that, uh, but to avoid the political problems, because uh, in the classic days, 
any kind of heresy was problematical. So they used exactly <coughs> uh, superstition might be a chimera, which is some mythical animal, and they emphasize that your sign might refer to something mythical, and the sex signification in any case was the same kind of signification, whether it was real or imaginary or uh, hypothetical. Now, there's different labels for the triangle, and I'm not going to go through them, but the point is there's a lot of versions. Uh, the scholastic version, signum conceptus uh, objectus, uh, the sign concept object, and uh, my uh, favorite philosopher, Charles Sanders, first called it sign and temper interpretive object, and then there's Brega, Husserl, Saussure, Tarski, and so on. The problem with Saussure and Tarski is that they only had dyadic relations. So, uh, uh, so here emphasize the two-way uh, uh, relationship between the sign and the signified, what signified, namely the concept or the uh, in, uh, or the interpretant. And uh, Tarski emphasized the relation between the sign and the object. So, so here and Tarski had only partial uh, triangles. They only had two sides, and they omitted the entire triangle. Now, if you really want to get an understanding of semiotics and its relationship to the world, really need that complete triangle. Uh, here's another point that these scholastics developed, and that is meta-language. They talked about uh, first intentions are relations between your signs and the thing itself, the, the object. So on the right-hand side triangle, that's the first, first intentional uh, triangle, where the name Yojo refers to the object, which is a subcat, and then at the top is the concept of Yojo. And the second intentions are language about language. And they emphasize all of science is meta-language. They, they did not use the word meta-language. They used the term uh, first or uh, second intentional. And it was Tarski who uh, added this, used the term uh, prefix meta. So Tarski is the one, when we talk about meta-language, we're using Tarski's terminology. But the uh, scholastics talk about the second intention where the symbol of the name, in quotes, Yojo in quotes, is a symbol of the name Yojo, and we have at the top the concept of that name. And uh, this is a fundamental principle of ontology that is essential for any modern ontology. This must be recognized because everything in our computer system is a sign. The computer itself is a giant semiotic processor and every, lang every programming language, every natural language, every uh, version of logic is a meta-language about uh, what's uh, being uh, represented in ordinary language. And we need to have uh, recognition of these relationships in order to have an adequate theory, not just about an ontology of the world, but we need an ontology of the language and an ontology of how language and logic and everything else are related to the world in order to understand how our computer systems, our databases and our knowledge bases and everything we develop are related to uh, what we're talking about and what actually exists. So these are a huge number of issues that were addressed back in the you know, 13th century, the 13th and 14th century really got through a high point in logic. And as I said, the 17th century was uh, a downward step from the heights of the uh, 14. Now, universal language schemes, uh, these <coughs> came up about in the 17th century when uh, Latin was being replaced. Latin was the primary uh, academic language. Everybody wrote, published in Latin. And by the 17th century, with the printing press and nation states, Latin was uh, vanishing, or at least it was losing its status. And so um, some of the major uh, thinkers like Francis Bacon, Descartes, Mersenne, Pascal, Newton, Leibniz were, present, were proposing mathematical principles as the basis for universal language scheme. And this is not a much different from what we're doing today. In fact, uh, if anything, some of those people are a lot uh, more uh, uh, in tune with the uh, principles of science and philosophy than uh, most ontologists are today. The largest and most impressive system was by John Wilkins, which was a significant system. Wilkins, by the way, was the first secretary of the uh, British Royal Society, and he got a number of the other uh, people working uh, who were also members of the Royal
Royal Society to collaborate with him. So, in, so Wilkins on Tulsi was actually uh, uh, developed by some pretty uh, intelligent people. Here's his upper level ontology, and there's a lot of complexity. A 670 page book, you can download that if you wish at archive.org. And uh, it has uh, 270 pages that start, define 40 genera, it's, uh, the, the genus and species idea, to over 2,000 species. And then, with uh, assistance from other members of the Royal Society, they have 15,000 words in English mapped to those things. So that's a very impressive uh, piece of work. And the top level, I believe, is still quite interesting. The, have, the top level split is between what Wilkins called transcendental and special. The special things include, uh, on the left-hand side, is the creator. This in those days was God, who was absolutely essential for anything in uh, those days. And uh, uh, under the on the other branch are the creatures. The creatures in in distinguished collectively uh, are uh, everything in the world and all the subsets about it, and distributively according to the categories that Aristotle had, starting with substance and accident. So under uh, substance and accident, uh, Wilkins included Aristotle's categories. And under transcendental, he had a three-way split according to the kinds of relations. Now, they did not have a good ad, uh, theory of relations in those days, but uh, uh, it's significant that Wilkins had a three-way split. And if you happen to know anything about Peirce, that's exactly what Peirce had. So this uh, goes a bit forward. And so the summary is a very impressive system. It, it was a failure as a replacement for Latin, but it was an inspiration for everybody that followed. Leibniz and Kant uh, explicitly referred to uh, the, uh, the uh, ma manuals by which they meant. Uh, Leibniz explicitly had, was, uh, there was a consultant on this uh, project by Wilkins and was very strongly impressed and, uh, by it, and uh, Kant followed on in that tradition. The division by collectively and distributively is a very important distinction that uh, many ontologies ignore. And this is one of my criticisms, is that, uh, of, uh, is that muriology is just one mathematical theory. In fact, it's a whole family of mathematical theories. And set theory <coughs> and uh, virtual reality and all kinds of computer systems with databases and knowledge bases, there's a huge amount of different theories of collection. And I do not believe that any single one of them is worthy of being put into the top level of the ontology. I don't believe that there's any version of muriology or set theory or any other version of collectivity that is uniquely valuable. I think they all have a lot to contribute, but none of them belong right at the top level. And uh, uh, one of the unfortunate uh, points is that there were some ad hoc features of the Wilkins thing. And you can't blame them. I mean, this was all developed in a relatively short time and uh, with a lot of the technology and science of the day, there's a lot to, to be uh, added. But the uh, top level, I believe, is good. And the version under it was uh, ridiculed by Jonathan Swift and the Academy of Lagado and uh, Jorge Luis Borges had uh, uh, a lot of other uh, ridiculing. But the point is, there's a lot good in it that I would recommend. Uh, Kant followed and had his 12 categories, and he claimed uh, that if one has the original and primitive concept, it is easy to add the derivative and subsidiary. And he said, it can easily be carried out with the aid of the ontological man, by which he meant the things such as Wilkins ontology, and there were others that were being developed around the same time. And uh, the point is that Kant said this was an easy task. That's what he said uh, in the late um, eight, uh, 18th century. And here we are two and a half centuries later, and we still aren't anywhere near that easy task. Uh, Kurt uh, discovered the meta-level patterns underlying the various kinds of triads. The, the first three, firstness is quality, secondness is reaction, thirdness is mediation, 
and they can be represented by monadic, dyadic, or triadic relations. And this is something that I believe is really critical, is bringing together versus semiotics with the ontology of everything that exists. And so what I have done is to take Wilkins' top level and relabel it using Purse's system. Now, I'm not saying that this is the absolute perfect top-level ontology. However, I am putting this up as a case to consider. I believe that this is this top level is superior to any other top level that I have ever seen uh, that anybody proposed by anybody else. That includes Psych and BFO and many others. And I believe that if we're going to put any top level into the part one of the proposed ISO standard, I believe that this version should be considered. Now, I don't know whether you want to put this tree as it stands in the top level, but I believe that every label on that tree is important. And if you notice that uh, there's that uh, distinction there uh, of, the, of science versus physics, and by physics I mean the same that uh, Heraclitus meant by nature, I would consider all of the observable, that everything observable is part of nature. But under physics, you have the laws of nature and the observable. And the laws of nature, uh, I would identify with the logo as uh, uh, the uh, as John the Evangelist said, the Logos is identified with God, and uh, the Logos is God, and uh, the laws of nature are effectively what creates everything that we have in the world, or, or it's according to, according to, uh, uh, according to Heraclitus, uh, it's kata, it's according to the, uh, Logos and, uh, and by John, it's, uh, it's, it's through the logos. And either way, the laws of nature are, or the logos are, uh, re uh, I replace the creator with those laws. And then on the left hand side, there are the signs, and uh, the signs <laughs> into the sign types uh, quality, reaction, med mediation. That is, uh, that is versus first uh, uh, triad. And then we have our tokens of the sign. The natural ones are the things that you see, natural signs, the, the images and uh, the sounds that you hear. Those are your natural signs. The conventional signs are your symbols that you just define. But for the sign, the types of the tokens are uh, related to everything in physics. Did somebody mute their mic? No, what is that noise? Somebody arrived recently. So now, as a general framework, I say that uh, the uh, first Wilkins top level is general, flexible, systematic, underspecified, but not vague. It is precise, but not vague. It's underspecified. That means that the specification would come in the micro theories or modules that come under it. So at the top level, you have very little. Uh, specification, it's relatively, it does not depend on any particular theory of semiotics, it does not depend on any particular theory of physics, but it's sufficiently underspecified that it could accommodate any and every theory that anybody has defined so far and probably any time in the uh, next couple of centuries. Now, I believe also that it has some advantages in comparison to part one of the ISO standard for ontology, proposed standard for ontology, and that is that the framework provides a slot for anything and everything. And the, uh, uh, that point is not emphasized in part one, and the BFO ontology, which is very close to part one, in fact, one, thing that, one reason why I complain about part one is that it's too biased for BFO. Now, I have nothing against BFO. My, added, my position is, People have found BFO to be useful, and my attitude is anything that anyone has found useful is indeed useful. But, my, uh, but the point I'm maintaining is that it's not sufficiently complete. It does not include the signs. It's not it's too specified. It has neurology, or in, in fact, one particular uh, vision of neurology built right into BFO. And I think that uh, uh, if we go back to the uh, uh, level that uh, uh, the, the previous diagram with uh, the 
a cut, a go down to the, sort of the bottom right hand side. There is collectively versus distributively, and collectively <laughs> is divided in two parts collection and system. Under collection, I would put any and every version of theoryology or set theory that anybody has proposed. And under system, I would mean something like uh, general system theory, which has been too much ignored, and, but it's still very important for a lot of uh, people who are developing practical applications, such as Bertalanti's uh, general system theory and various follow-on to it, I believe are just as important as any theory of Mariology, and we should consider the structures because uh, general system theory considers structures and dynamically operating structures. Mariology does not. It's just a static sort of, well, it, it could be dynamic ontology. Uh, you could have time variations in mariology, but I believe that the uh, system, every uh, living organism is closer to a system than a collection, and so I think that's uh, collectively uh, uh, branch must be subdivided into collections versus systems. There's a lot more that can be said, but this is just the basic points I'd make. And uh, in their patterns of ontology, now uh, we started a little bit late, but I'm getting into, I think the half hour is getting close to being finished, and I want to have a chance to give Barry a chance. So let me just quickly mention that. I'm talking about patterns of ontology are everything that anybody knows, does, feels, or thinks, and that includes parts, shapes, spaces, distance, and most importantly, life. Every thought, intention, preference, or social relation is fundamental, and it must be part of the ontology, and it, there must be slots for it, at least the sentence for those slots, right at the top level. And I do not believe that it's appropriate to put uh, the, only under the uh, physics, I believe that all branches of science should be uh, under physics, uh, the uh, natural sciences, but the laws must include also the laws of social sciences and the way that all the animals and people behave, uh, that the way your cats and dogs and uh, people all behave are influenced by our culture, but culture itself is part of the laws of how people work. And all of those things must be in the ontology. There must be room for it right up the, at the top. Temporal patterns, intentionality. Intentionality, I believe, is absolutely essential. That uh, meaning, intention, purpose, and value originate with life. And uh, Aristotle used the term telos or final idea, sometimes translated as, uh, 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 as final purpose, but it's or cause, final cause. But it's idea is more than just uh, cause it includes explanation, and uh, there's a lot more that has to be said. I won't have a chance to say all this right this minute, but also situations and context, examples of a situation, meaningful aspects of situations, patterns of situations, patterns of patterns of patterns, and then language on ontology. I believe this is absolutely essential that no single ontology can be complete, consistent, and universal in the same sense that none of our laws of science are complete, consistent, and universal. And we will have to have at the top an under-specified framework that can support anything. And then we have to relate language to logic. And my favorite quote is one by Charles Sanders Peirce, a succinct but accurate summary of all these issues. It is easy to speak with precision upon a general theme. Only one must commonly surrender all ambition to be certain. It is equally easy to be certain one has only to be sufficiently vague. It is not so difficult to be pretty precise and fairly certain at once about a very narrow subject. And that's what I would say about our ontologies, that precision is only going to be uh, uh, pretty precise and fairly certain, will only be down in the lower levels in our micro theory. At the top, it will be vague, or I would say not quite vague, but underspecified. So at the top, we want it to be certain. We have to be sufficiently vague. The term I would use there is underspecified. And to be, uh, it, and then the first that is equally easy to be certain. What, uh, or it, it, uh, uh, only, uh, uh, is, yeah, it is, it is equally easy to be certain, but one has only to uh, uh, be sufficiently vague. And I would say, uh, 
underspecified. And then for our ontology, down at the lower levels where we have to do our reasoning, that's where we are pretty precise and fairly certain at once about a very narrow subject. And that's where the real reasoning occurs, is at the lower level, not at the top level. And uh, so then I would say that these are the issues that we have to deal with. Thesaurus versus ontology, and Peter Roger was also <coughs> of the British Royal Society, and he was inspired by the work by Wilkins. He came a couple centuries later, and his uh, very underspecified thesaurus just uh, was, became an almost overnight success. By 1869, he had produced 28 editions. His first edition had 15,000 words in it, which was the same, by the way, as the number of words in Wilkins' version. However, it, he kept adding with it and had 28 editions in just a, a not 17 years, and his son continued the work. And today, Roger Cesaris is one of the uh, things that people are, are using very heavily. Um, there's also various other methods, and I'm not going to have to uh, be able to go through all of these. And I'm just going to talk about interoperability. There's a lack of consensus, which is inevitable. A descriptive ontology is always fallible, but we need to have some sort of um, but for any a specific application, we need a normative ontology. If you have a very specific application for a computer system or, for, say, for a particular industry, you can be very narrow and have a standard for that. But uh, the standard will have to change and evolve uh, as you develop new uh, applications. And there are these requirements for interoperability among independently developed systems. We need an underspecified descriptive upper level ontology that describes how people, the, the various categories that are general across the board, and the details and the precision must come in an open ended variety of micro theories. So that's basically uh, what I have to say. And um, I was still working on these slides until the last minute. So I have not had a chance to upload them to my website, but I'll do that. Uh, later this week, I'll have these slides plus a revised version <coughs> uh, plus a few more extended extensions to it, and I'll upload that to my website and I'll circulate a note about this to the uh, web. So I'm finished with my part, and uh, Barry, I still can have a lot more to say. So, Barry, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to talk to him. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Good. <coughs> okay, so um, as John explained, I didn't really uh, get to see his slides until a few minutes before I had to respond to them. Um, fortunately, I, uh, I had prepared some slides in advance on the basis of... Um, common exchanges uh, between uh, John Sower and many other people on the Ontolog Forum. I'm not going to talk about the ISO standard today. I'm, I'm not allowed to do that according to ISO rules. I will just mention that the part one is a, is a set of requirements for being a top-level ontology, so it should not itself contain a top-level ontology. And John is quite right that the early versions of the part one were... Um, uh, inspired too directly by basic formal ontology, but I'm confident that that problem has been solved. Uh, now, to move on to, um, uh, to the, the, the debate. So, John didn't really present uh, a proposal to be debated, uh, which I could then refute. So, I agreed, of course, with a lot of the things which John said about the history of philosophy and about Russian semiotics and so forth. Um, I'm more interested in having a real debate. And so I have taken some places where John, in his inimitable fashion, has attacked me aggressively. And of course, I don't, I don't mind being attacked aggressively. I think that that's the way that we make progress. Uh, if everyone is nice and agrees with everyone, then we will never make progress. Uh, what I do object to is where John attacks me aggressively and says something which is false. 
So let me, um, let me start from the year 2002. Uh, in that year, I received uh, quite a large award from the German government to set up this institute. And this generated a certain amount of email traffic on the conceptual graphs email uh, forum Piper Mail, um, including uh, this email by John to somebody called Graham Schutt. Graham was inquiring about whether John thought that I was a good person to uh, lead an institute in medical ontology, the world's first institute in medical ontology. And John says, he has published a lot of nonsense on the subject, which seems to, ha seems to have misled many people. But I seriously doubt that anything useful will come of it. Now, I'm going to spend a few slides describing what was useful, I think, which came out of IFAMIS. So the background is the Human Genome Project, which was rooted, of course, in the work already done in various other uh, genome projects, particularly the fly genome. And one of the leaders of the fly genome created something called the gene ontology. And the gene ontology is by far the most successful scientific ontology that we have. It's indispensable to large areas of biological and biomedical research. And what it does is it links the, um, the new data which we have from, for instance, decoding the fly genome to the old terms used by biologists, which I will describe in a minute. And this is the paper unveiling the fly genome. And one of the lead authors is Michael Ashburner, who was the creator of the gene ontology. This is how biology data looked before the human genome. This is how biology data looks new nowadays because of the, uh, the genome project. And the problem is, how do we link these two kinds of data? And the gene ontology solved this problem. And the, the, this is quite a standard uh, set of methodologies now for using the gene ontology and for using the data which has been annotated using the gene ontology in order to do biological re research, in order to do medical research, in order to, to do medical diagnosis even, in order to do drug discovery, and so on and so on. Now... The gene ontology, as I say, has been tremendously influential. It's multi-species, so it enables biologists working on fly to compare their data with biologists working on human because they both use the same gene ontology terms. And I like to see this as something comparable to the standardization of units of measure uh, that it enabled people doing physics in Paris to compare their data with people doing physics in London. And what happens is you get then millions and millions of data points, all of which are tagged with corresponding gene ontology terms. And this enables the data to be navigated, integrated, compared, analyzed, and so forth. It's incredibly useful. Now, I did not create the gene ontology. It existed before I even knew about biomedicine, uh, biomedical informatics, all of those things which uh, the gene ontology was useful for. But as soon as I saw it, I immediately realized that it was the tool which would form the centerpiece for ontological research in medicine and biology uh, uh, in the subsequent years. And I, I came across it in around 2003. And then I think I did something useful. So when I looked at the gene ontology, I saw that it was full of mistakes. And these are mistakes which John, too, would recognize as mistakes. And I'll give you some examples. When I realized that the gene ontology, which on the one hand was clearly an invaluable artifact for doing bioinformatics and biomedical informatics, I also see that they were doing lots of things wrong. So I organized the meeting. I had lots of money, so I invited the leadership of the gene ontology to my institute in Germany to a meeting called the Formal Architecture of the Gene Ontology. And at that meeting, I gave a talk called Stop. And my idea was that the gene ontology was doing some things wrong. Now, I, I had many things. I'm just going to give you a few examples of things that they were doing wrong. First of all, many of their definitions were circular. 
So self-hate commitment is defined as the commitment of cells to blah, blah, and their capacity to differentiate. Now, this is a definition of the form X is an A means X is an A and X is a B. Now, that is worse than circular. Another example, this is not worse. Well, this is worse than circular, too. Um, you cannot define hemolysis as the processes that cause hemolysis. There are problems with part of and with constituents and structure and unit terms. So there's no way you can infer from the gene ontology what the relation is between structural constituent of ribosome and large ribosomal subunit. And you, you should be able to make those distinctions clear because, as John emphasized, unless you give clear definitions of terms, people will misuse terms there will be then a failure of bringing about the kind of interoperability which ontologies are primarily designed to uh, support. Another one is problems with words like within. So the gene ontology has a term lytic vacu vacuole within a protein storage vacuole, which is different from a plain ordinary lytic vacuole. This is like having two, wor two words for car, cars, and then cars which are in tunnels. Cars which are in tunnels are not special animals different from cars. But the gene ontology makes it even worse. So the gene ontology says that a lytic vacuole within a protein storage vacu vacuole um, is a protein storage vacuole, which is a bit like saying car within a tunnel is a tunnel. Now, that is not a good treatment of cars or tunnels. It's like saying an embryo within a uterus is a uterus. That would be disastrous for human survival. So this is a big mistake, and there were many such mistakes. And I, I, I truly, I think I humiliated Michael Ashburner. He was the, uh, the leader of the gene ontology, a very uh, distinguished uh, chain-smoking Englishman. And he and I did a sort of deal. I agreed that I would never again criticize the gene ontology in public, uh, apart from today, of course. And in return, he said that I would be in charge of the logic of the gene ontology henceforth, which is the work I've been doing in various ontology projects in biology ever since. So the GO has three sub-ontologies, cellular component, molecular function, and biological process. And these three sub-ontologies are the basis for a large fraction of the uh, most important discoveries in biomedicine and biology research since the uh, human genome was decoded. Now, what the, the, the first thing that I did in order to clean up the logic of the GO was to create BFO. And BFO is, at the very top, just a reverse engineering of the top level. <laughs> So independent continuance correspond to cellular components, dependent continuance correspond to molecular functions, and biological processes correspond to occurrence. So the gene ontology is a specialization of BFO. This is what BFO, or a bit more of BFO, looks like, and we have some nice ISA relations here. So every independent continuant is a continuant, and so forth. This is not rocket science. And then BFO works because biology ontologies or other kinds of ontologies extend BFO downwards through definitions. And the thesis that we make is that BFO has enough content to enable all terms that you might want to tag data with to be defined as children or grandchildren. So this is one example. This is the emotion ontology which extends the mental functioning ontology even further. And again, you have a lot of ISA relations. You also have other kinds of relations. For instance, in here's in, or is agent of, or is output of, and so on. So this is, um, this is a nice clean ISA hierarchy, isn't it? So we have BFO role is a dependent continuant. BFO process is an occurrent. It's very, very simple. It's, uh, it's not rocket science. This is the best ontology John Sower has ever seen. Now, I don't understand this, even the beginnings of this ontology. So what are these lines connecting the terms? 
So if we, if we, if that is a, then we end up with things like mediation is a types or distributively is a physics or quality is a science. None of those things mean anything to me. Uh, so I, it can't possibly be Isa, or if it is, then no one thought through what the consequences would be from the fact that Isa is transitive. Uh, so it's not yet quite the best ontology I have ever seen. It has deep problems. And then John says, commenting on this diagram, signs include all data and sensory stimuli from any source, including proprioception. Now, I really don't understand what the relation is between proprioception and signs, whether it's Isa or part of or something else. I don't understand the relation. So again, it's, uh, the more work is needed. So back to the, ge the gene ontology. It covers three sorts of biological entities, two sorts of continuance, one sort of occurrence. <laughs> um, but it doesn't provide representations of many other parts of biology, and so other ontologies needed to be built. And even before I met the gene ontology leadership, people were building those ontologies, but they were building them in the same logically rather sloppy way that the gene ontology had been built. And so, again, as part of the work of developing BFO and working with gene ontology, uh, we published this paper on what we call the OBO foundry. That's open biomedical ontologies. This, I, it, the foundry means that we're going to build these ontologies in a very rigorous way. This is going to be like mining. And this, I think, is the second thing I did, which is useful. And I, I am sure that many biologists recognize that utility. And the best, uh, the best evidence I have for that is that they give me uh, support, financial support, on grants where they need work by an ontologist. And w when, I, when I work on those grants, I use the Oboe Foundry and I use BFO. So the OBO foundry is based on a hub and spokes approach. The BFO is the hub and then various ontologies. For instance, the mental functioning ontology serve as immediate spokes to BFO and then the emotion ontology extends the mental functioning ontology as, as its immediate hub. And this means the ontologies are all networked together through, through the pra practice of BFO as the hub creates a weak kind of interoperability. Now, I have never, ever made the claim, in spite of John having made this argument in several uh, emails, that BFO solves the problem of interoperability. It's incredibly difficult to solve the problem of interoperability. And the problem is incredibly serious. And if we have even one small way in which we can address that problem, then that brings benefits. And BFO, I know, brings benefits along those lines. One benefit is that for a while anyway, the gene ontology was reconciled with the semantic web. So I was the person who was working with both the gene ontology and with Mark Musen when the National Center for Biomedical Ontology was founded. And I was responsible for dissemination and ontology best practices within the NCBO. And um, I think I can illustrate very clearly uh, what happens when you create biomedical and bi biological ontologies without something like the methodology of the OBO foundry. So as I think everyone knows, the BioPortal is a very large repository of bioontologies, and it has one serious error. There are too many crappy ontologies within the NCBO which do not integrate with the other crappy ontologies within, within the BioPortal. So the unifying goal of the BioPortal was integration of biological and clinical data through tagging with ontologies. So um, um, John, in 2002, wrote another uh, email. Um, this one, uh, again, attacking me personally. He's not only misguided, he is profoundly, obsessively misguided. His misunderstanding of purse comes from his obsessive search for fragments that fit his own world view, while ignoring everything outside his extremely narrow perspective. Now, I never in my life did any kind of obsessive search for fragments. <coughs> I, I, I never do any kind of obsessive work when I'm dealing with philosophers who fall outside my rather narrow scope. I have not read purse. I have never had 
purses collected works in my hand. I have a few quotes which I stole haphazardly and serendipitously from other places. But John has some kind of fictional view according to which I am the anti-purse and I'm obsessively (laughs) trying to bring down his God. And that's just not the way I am. I'm much more uh, quiet and relaxed than that. All right, now in this email, uh, the the uh, word purpose is used and, and John immediately fixates on this purpose. He says, the word purpose is significant because I and other people who came from an AI background were emphasizing the need to re- recognize the purpose of any representation. Now, when the bio portal was created, I objected that all of these bad ontologies were being admitted to the bioportal when they were obviously bad and useless and were breaking interoperability. And the response which came back, which presumably was from uh, followers of John, was, oh no, you can't build an ontology without a purpose. Our purpose is cancer biology, so we have to have a special ontology. My purpose is uh, smoking addiction, so I need another special ontology, and, and therefore you got hundreds of special ontologies, none of which was any good. That's wrong. Purpose is irrelevant to building a good ontology. Now, again, we kept saying, so this is John again, that that you cannot do knowledge representation without considering purpose. And and now he says, Barry would turn livid, livid. I am now turning livid, ladies and gentlemen, at any such claim because I was trying to do formal ontology in a sneer quote, scientific matter, in which all consideration of purpose is forbidden. Now, that's not true, actually. The BFO has a term function, and we are exploring the idea of using a similar term, namely purpose, to understand the analog of functions for organizations. I have nothing against purposes. I think they're very hard to deal with in ontologies, And that's why BFO still has not found a way of dealing with them, which enables clear definitions to be formulated and tested. But we are working on it. We're not desperately trying to exclude purpose from reality. What we do want to exclude is that the view is is widespread that when you're building reference ontologies or scientific ontologies or even useful ontologies for addressing problems like the problem of interoperability, then you should not try and address your ontology for some specific purpose. You should be as generic as possible. All ontologies which start out from some specific body of data, rather than starting out from the entities in reality which those data are about, fail. And I'll explain what failure means very soon. So... All right, so now the unifying goal of the BioPortal, remember, was integration of biological clinical data. Because people used purpose as the basis for building too many ontologies, you end up with too many ontologies. So if you go to the BioPortal and you search for obesity, you find these ontologies, 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 And finally, we're at the end. Now, we just need one ontology in which obesity is defined. And then everyone who needs to have the term obesity in their ontology should reuse that definition. That is a principle for ontology development. We have those principles. We've worked them out. Uh, They involve the use of a common top-level ontology. Clearly, ideally, you should only have one. For building domain ontologies at lower levels of generality, you need spokes, all of which descend from BFO and which are maintained by experts, by people who really know about cell biology or whatever it might be. And then because the top level ontology and the principles are quite small, you can use them to train people so that they know how to build ontologies successfully and so forth. All of this has worked very well in the... um, biomedical domain, and as a result, the BFO is the most reused source ontology in the bioportal. And IAO, which I will come to in a minute, is the second most reused source ontology. 
even more reused than the goat. So we are clearly doing something right. That's the same data, larger. Now, I know because of some of the, this useful work that I did for the biologists, increasingly um, in demand in the military and intelligence world, because they too have recognized that this hub and spokes approach with common principles and top level ontology is a good way of solving the immense problems of interoperability in the military uh, domain. Now, um, I have worked with people who are trying to solve these problems and, and basically they come under two headings. On the one hand, there are the NEATS, which is me, and on the other hand, there are the scruffies, which is John. And the scruffies say, oh, natural language, the troops use natural language, the analysts use natural language, they have to study data which comes in the form of natural language. So we should have at most this kind of word netty thing which will be very, very loosey-goosey so that we can stay close to the sources. Uh, this, the NEATS people say... But the military is run on the basis of the joint doctrine hierarchy. Every area of military activity is precisely defined on the basis of general principles. And the general terms used in formulating those principles are precisely defined in the dictionary of military and associated terms, which is joint doctrine publication 1-02. And you can see it up there on the left. And so we have built our military and intelligence ontologies based on the joint doctrine hierarchy. We have something like a set of laws and a set of definitions which serve very well for the purposes of building a neat ontology. And um, Now John, in, again in various places and at various times, has argued that any top-level ontology should have a place for universals, a place for information artifacts, and a place for purpose. And I'm going to go through these three very quickly. So he's wrong about number one. Um, this is UFO A, the UFO ontology of endurance. I believe that UFO is not so good a top-level ontology as BFO, but I have my uh, moments when I respect it. So I think it does some things right, and, and uh, I, I, I don't think it should be ignored. But it gets this particular thing, which John thinks is indispensable to a, 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 a top-level ontology, wrong because it follows John. So if you see, this is an ontology which has the word particular on the left and the word universal on the right. And you might say, that's fine, no problem. The world, after all, if you're a realist like me, contains both particulars and universals. And similarly, we have event universals and event particulars on the right in the perdurant ontology of UFO. And in GFO also, we have categories and individuals, both of which are, are subclasses of item, and item is a subclass of entity. Now, the problem is, let's just look at UFO A again more closely. We have particular instance of universal, but particular itself is a universal as it appears on the page because it has a sub-universal or a subclass, concrete particular, which in turn has endurant as one of its subclasses. So what we have is particular is a universal, which is an instance of universal. And so universal must include both universals which have particular instances as instances and universals which have universals as instances, such as the universal particular. But that means that the universal particular is also a subclass of the universal universal. And the universal universal is also a subclass of the universal universal. And entity is also a subclass of universal universal. And it gets worse. All the universals repeat all the particulars. So every particular quality corresponds to a universal. Every particular color corresponds to the universal color. So you're, you end up rewriting the entire ontology twice, once under the heading of particulars or individuals, once under the heading of universals. Now, anyone who thinks carefully about signs should realize that you can't have an ontology which uses universal and particular to represent different things because there are universals only to the degree 
that there are particulars which are instances of those universals. It just creates a doubling and it creates an incoherence and it creates an endless hierarchy of universals of universals of universals. All right, no place for information artifacts. John says these things must be recognized by every ontology. Now, an ontology of nematode worm anatomy should not recognize language or signs or intentionality because it's about nematode worms. So he can't quite be right in saying that every ontology must recognize the concept of name and so forth. Um, now, we do, in fact, uh, recognize that BFO needs a term to represent signs, information entities more generally. And we address this in the only major revision of BFO, which was BFO 1.1, when we added generically dependent continuance. And information entities are, are children of the generically dependent continuance. Or to be more precise, the universal information entity is a child of the universal generically dependent continuance. And so IAO, as we already saw, has been very successful. And everything under the IAO column is about something. So that's intentionality, John. All right. So I don't think we, I need to show that we also do life and, and organisms and intentionality and so, on, so forth. We have the mental functioning ontology. We have more than 200 biological ontologies which descend from BFO. That means that many people at least must be confident that they can do life by using BFO ontology as their top-level starting point. We can't do quantum mechanics. I agree with this, and I think this is a serious problem, but fortunately it's not an urgent problem because we have no quantum mechanics users. When we do have such users, and it's, it's, it's foreseeable that we will, so light, for instance, uh, and vision are both phenomena which are important to biology but which involve quantum mechanical dimensions. So it's a serious problem which we will address in due course. Now, then comes John. So this was in 2017. Scientists in physics, chemistry, biology never use the BFO terms to state or describe their research data or theories. This is, we're not trying to provide terms for scientists. That's not our job. There is cancer of the liver, but there is no cancer of the independent continuance. So that's not what we're trying to do. But BFO is being used in physics, chemistry, and biology a lot already. So this is just one example of a very large ontology project in the European Union, uh, which is using BFO as the basic structure. And you can see how it fits with BFO. And, and all of these things here are continuant. Um, John says, in the physical sciences, everything is a process. Now, I, I, I think that John here is making the fallacy of gray. So there is a continuous um, set of transitions between black and white. Therefore, black does not exist and white does not exist. Therefore, everything is gray. Now, John's characteristic argument is that there is a continuous transition between continuance and occurrence, but he makes an even stronger claim Therefore, everything is an occurrence, at least in physics. That's what he says. An object is a process that changes so slowly and so on. So he says that this is, uh, he says biology is a physical science. That was here. Um, now, biologists, uh, chemists use BFO. You can go to this video and see the leading uh, uh, editor of the uh, Kebi chemistry ontology explaining how important BFO was for the development of Kebi. Okay. Those three sub-ontologies tell you already, two of them are continuant ontologies, that for biology, continuants are indispensable if you're going to do science. And the same holds if you're going to do medical science. So there are occurrence here, but there are also continuants such as people and tumors and so forth. And I'm not going to go any further. So I agree with John about Higgs bosons and unicorns. Uh, we should not include a distinction between fantasy and reality in our ontology. If people want to describe unicorns, they can use exactly the same ontological means as it for any other topic. They would be wasting their time, of course, but that's another story. I deny what, what um, John 
asserts is a fundamental principle, namely that there is a continuum between fantasy and reality. Let me first say that I agree with uh, Barry about a huge amount, and I apologize that uh, uh, for writing some of these notes back in 2002 and so on. To, uh, these were private notes, which, as everybody knows, anything that you write privately over the email is going to escape eventually to uh, the universe. So I apologize for some of the uh, uh, slurs. I, one of the things that influenced me around in the 2000-2002 era was the debate between Barry and John Thurl about uh, uh, social reality. And I think that uh, uh, I, I agree that Thurl was really won that debate, you know, just hands down. And that in that point, Searle was uh, saying things that could be mapped to Peirce's uh, uh, semiotics very nicely and cleanly. Uh, unfortunately, Peirce had probably never studied more about Peirce. Searle had probably never studied more about Peirce than Barry did. So he was not able to use the full power of Peirce's semiotics. But it, it, uh, because Peirce was closer, Searle was closer to Peirce, he really had a foundation that was far and away superior to what Barry did uh, back in 1999 or whenever that the debate was. And if that uh, Barry has changed since then, you know, I'll retract any of my slurs or whatever. Now, as far as the issues about logic, I completely agree with uh, Barry's revisions of the uh, uh, gene ontology. And I heartily agree with, I would, I would have done exactly the same kind of thing. I've done the same kind of analysis, and I heartily agree with uh, what Barry has done. I completely ignore, or, uh, the word ignore, that I was thinking of uh, a term. This was something that I read also on the internet. This was by somebody who was endorsing BFO, and his comment was that BFO, he was making favorable comments about it, and the best thing he had to say was, BFO does not get in the way. And I agree with him entirely. BFO, uh, as it is, can be used for uh, the applications that Barry has said that it's done quite well, because you can ignore it. There's practically nothing in BFO that is relevant that would create a dis uh, that would create a conflict with anything that I have proposed. So in that sense, it's fine. Now, um, Barry has uh, complained about the uh, 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 ontology by John Wilson, which I relabeled uh, with a, a different set of names. Now, I apologize for not having really long labels that would use the terms that I put there and have uh, enough qualification to state it in a form that would give you a proper is a hierarchy. I apologize for that. I was doing that to illustrate how Wilkins' ontology, how his top level could be mapped into a, uh, into a top level in which uh, I completely agree with Barry is, uh, should be an is a hierarchy. I also uh, object to the point where he said, uh, compared himself to a neat and calling me a scruffy because I have been uh, called a, uh, uh, two people, many people have said that I have been far too neat and everything I say is uh, logic, logic, logic. And I do talk about logic, logic, logic when I'm talking about logic, but I also emphasize the point that there is this continuum. Now, when I, I said there's a continuum between uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, between process and object, I am following uh, Whitehead, who, as everybody knows, had written one of the most uh, influential books on uh, uh, logic ever written. And in fact, he was a senior author. He's the one who just developed almost all of the technical material in there because uh, Russell was much, much less technical than uh, Whitehead was. And in Whitehead's process in reality, he wrote, presented that as a series of lectures and never really had the chance to uh, formalize that. But on one point where uh, every, object, every object is a process, on that point, I believe there's absolutely no disagreement whatsoever because in science, in physics, everything is indeed a process. And the only difference you can find are those processes that change slowly enough that you can recognize them on different occurrences. So the point is that, uh, indeed, 
Uh, I think we can defend it right here and uh, in any scientific circle. Uh, Ken, are you standing there with a comment? Or? Oh, okay. I, I was done talking to work. Okay. All right. So, uh, as far as the uh, notes that I sent back in 2002, I apologize for uh, sending notes privately. And, you know, I was uh, sort of objecting to some of the things that were being said, especially about the, the uh, social reality and the uh, debates between uh, uh, Barry and uh, Searle. And, uh, in fact, one of the, uh, well, uh, that's another story. But, can, I, uh, can I, John? Can I just say one thing about that John Searle debate? Uh, so you say that John won that debate hands down. Uh, in fact, John himself uh, actually changed his earlier view. He thinks I won that debate. So in his book, The Construction of Social Reality, he defends the view that you think is wonderful. I attacked it. And in Making the Social World, he has a long preface in which he explains how he needed to reformulate his position as a result of my critique. Now, John Searle okay. is, 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 he almost never admits that he is in error. So that was quite an unusual um, confession. Okay, well, okay, thank you for that information. I'll have to go back and uh, correct Searle. But the point is that Searle, uh, Searle had a track relationship with the Searle Institute that could be mapped very clearly into the Searle Institute and the Searle Institute for I agree. I agree with you about the importance of things like contracts and documents, and we can deal with them. We have IAO, we have the document ontology, and so forth. So this is not a, a, a criticism. This is the point where we agree. Okay. If, if, if you agree with that, then, I, then, then we agree. I'm happy to have that clarification. And I unfortunately had not heard uh, that you had uh, made change that position because the old thing is still uh, the old document is still on your website, and there is no point. To, uh, there is no. Point so to I hope it is. I hope it isn't on my website. If it is, I should. Uh, you should send me the link because it's not supposed to be. The new. The new standard is um, has addressed many, many uh, suggestions which have come in from across the world. Okay. So, well, maybe so. I would like to see the new version, and I'll try checking for it. I have not seen it recently. Okay. Yeah, you're, 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 yes. Uh, just the ISO process wants this whole thing to be confidential between the national committees. That's the way ISO works. Okay. So I, I don't want you to violate anything that has yep. to do with ISO. Really. Okay. But the point I would uh, emphasize, by the way, all the uh, revisions of the gene ontology basically are what any anybody who has had experience in uh, language analysis, conceptual analysis, and uh, definitions and uh, with a fair background in, no in logic could do. And I'm sure that you did uh, a fine job in clarifying all those definitions. I have done similar work uh, and I have talked to many people working with expert systems and so on who have uh, really gone in and stepped in and reviewed uh, these various kinds of things that people call ontologies or knowledge representations or whatever and have found incredible numbers of errors of the same sort that you found. And yeah. as I yeah. uh, mentioned, uh, that I want to be one of somebody who was a supporter of BFO who said, it doesn't get in the way. I agree that 
BFO, as it stands, would fit very nicely under the ontology that I uh, wrote, the version of the relabeled version of Wilkins ontology. And I agree that I really should go and clarify every one of those labels and state it in the form of a predicate such that every predicate uh, at the top is a generalization of every one below it. So I and then, and that, then, then, John, you need to go out into the world and work closely with scientists in different disciplines and get 300 groups of those scientists to, scientists to accept your ontology as the basis for their work. Then, oh, yes. I think, well, then we can start talking about um, uh, which ontology is more successful or more useful. Yes, of course, and I certainly... And this was my, this was my answer to that. the first, I've done that. first okay, question. I do that on a regular basis, okay? Now, and I certainly agree with you. So, what, well, what is the evidence? What is the lasting record of the ontology that you've created that is being used by hundreds of different groups across the world? to serve uh, an interoperability in the way I described. I suspect that there is no group that is using your Percy and Wilkins to, as the basis for tagging scientific data. Is that right? There's, I have consulted with various people who have Yeah, but is there any evidence? Is there any data online which we, where we can see the, uh, the Peirce Wilkins ontology or the Peirce Wilkins SOA ontology being used to tag data for scientific purposes. The first uh, Wilkins ontology is one that I just uh, uh, proposed uh, fairly recently. I see. Recently. Okay. Yeah, this is okay. the first time I put it into anything okay. like this. Okay. Good. Now, Good. So I'll, we'll come back in five years and do this test. But the point that I do make is that the signs are in reality a must uh, are parallel ontology. Now, the point that you were making about the iteration, the endless iteration, that is the kind of endless iteration that uh, does not occur. You have to distinguish your levels of meta level. Your meta level is always about the version. So that the signs, when you're talking about how signs relate to the object, you're not creating a duplication of every one of the labels. What you're doing is an analyzing at the meta level. And as for universals in particular, my recommendation, that which I have stated many times, is that in a upper level, in a, in a standard, say, for example, uh, the proposed uh, standard for ontology, the word universal and particular should be deleted because there's a huge amount of, of, of conflict about those terms, a huge amount of baggage that has accumulated. And what I recommend is a replacement of the word uh, universal with uh, the technical term of predicate, in, as in predicate calculus, or relation, as in common logic. Because every time the word uh, universal occurs, you can always have a monadic, dyadic, or triadic relation that represents that universal. And then you can deal with the issues of, of, of meta levels precisely in the same way that logicians have dealt with meta levels all the time, and including in common logic, and they follow on the uh, ICRIS, the uh, uh, interoperable knowledge language, they deal with those issues very clearly, very precisely, and by the way, so did Kurt, who also used meta levels in his, uh, uh, in his uh, system. Yeah. So on that point, we have no quarrel. No. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to jump in here. The, um, the summit this year is about context. So I think it would be really helpful if both of you would comment on the uh, issues that you see are important about context. So Barry, with it? Yes, so, yep, I will make a start. Um, so I've been working recently with uh, 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 some, uh, a German colleague of mine uh, who is um, addressing the problem of deep learning and language understanding. And uh, I, I think he's doing something very original, which is to take something like a Gibsonian idea of affordances to define the context of language use. Now, when human beings use language, they, they interpret the language always in relation to the context in which they are uh, living or in which they're experiencing the world. And that, that context is determined by their 
goals and their purposes. So human beings interpret language spontaneously and they interpret the world spontaneously using the same kinds of um, contextual affordances. And one of the areas where I'm pushing uh, BFO in a direction towards a language ontology, which we still really don't have, is to try and build an account of linguistic meaning which takes context in the Gibsonian sense into account. So uh, context is the collection of affordances by which an organism such as a human being is influenced in their experience and uh, perception and activity. And if we have a better understanding of context in the, uh, as a collection of affordances, then we will be able, he thinks, to make better progress in simulating in the computer what humans do when they spontaneously interpret events in the world or language in the world as being meaningful. Well, the point that I make about context is that there cannot be a particular ontology, a uh, special kind of ontology about context. And namely, con ontology, a context is always related to whatever text you happen to be dealing with at the moment. Whether you're a reader of a document or you're a speaker in a discourse, the context involves, uh, first of all, the uh, surrounding propositions or sentences or uh, speech before and after the particular uh, sentence you're trying to interpret. And that's the immediate context in that document itself. Then you also have uh, the background knowledge, which is in the, uh, uh, which the speaker and the audience or the people who are in some kind of a uh, discourse, the common knowledge that they all agree on, any and or all of that is part of the context. So that in order to interpret any particular sentence of the document, you always have to bring in the surrounding sentences in that document as a primary context. <laughs> then you have to bring in the background knowledge that, uh, that the author or the participants in a discussion assume as background knowledge. And then the third part is the immediate, immediate surrounding. So, for example, for those of us in this room here, uh, there are all the people that we're addressing, and for anybody on the uh, telecom, it's all the people out there that we're addressing, and all of that, uh, all of those people and their interests are all part of the larger context. And when you talk about, uh, some people have used the term ontology of context, I would prefer to just say it's a classification of all the many ways in which various kinds of knowledge can be used to come brought to bear on understanding a particular text. And so I consider that Contextual analysis is part of the process of language understanding. If you're doing it by computer system, it's part of your natural language processing. And it's always at a meta level. It's not uh, part of your ontology itself. So that's... Jerry, do you have anything to add? Um, only that, uh, that, that John makes clear, and I agree that the word context has two central meanings. One is the context in which a, an organism lives and experiences the world, and the other is a context in the sense of the, the context of a piece of text. And I, I think that there are some parallels between these two, those two meanings of context, but they probably need to be dealt with um, independently or at least separately. And then the, finally I would make a point which I was trying to make a minute ago, which is that in order to simulate in a computer what human beings can do with language, we are going to need to simulate in a computer what human beings do with the contextual clues that they, they find in their perceptual environment. For instance, when they recognize some fearsome animal is, is running towards them and spontaneously react by running away. Computers can't do that kind of thing because they don't have, uh, I think a gentleman earlier used the word teleology. They don't have uh, motives, desires, purposes in the way in which human beings do. And it's those motives which enable human beings to spontaneously interpret both the world around them and the language that people use. Well, I think that uh, our two different, uh, what we have both been saying could be resolved. Uh, without too much trouble, but the basic point is that it's, that context is not a part of your ontology. It's not a part of your logic. 
but it's a part of the methods of processing whatever uh, text or discourse you happen to be analyzing at the moment. And so that is a separate issue that's outside what we have just been discussing. Okay, uh, we can now finally open up to questions. I have some questions. Um, so kind of um, kind of working backwards. Um, okay. Uh, kind of working backwards. Um, uh, I work in uh, quantum physics or quantum computation theory, I should say. Um, so, and I offer this as a comment, not as a truthful statement. It's an interpretation. Uh, in quantum physics, and going back to the work of uh, John von Neumann and uh, more recently John Baez, Jacob Diamante, these are all kind of well known in, in that field. Um, Seth Lloyd, um, contextuality is in the eye of the beholder of he who measures the quantum system. Because the quantum system is influenced and changes interactively with the interactor. That is the measure. So context in the case of quantum systems is an emergent property. It is not an a priori denotationally defined uh, idea. It's operational semantics are what dominate its understanding, or at least in the eye of the beholder. And so there is an argument to be made that there is a continuum from reality to fantasy since the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, the Copenhagen interpretation, brings these uh, points as valuable and I think debatable. Um, I don't know the answer to it, but I'm merely sharing that a lot of famous people have been debating it and I'm in that debate. Um, last but not least, inside of that mention, which relates to uh, the point that Barry Smith made about there not being an ontology for quantum mechanics, my observation, and again, I don't know much about the uh, BFO, uh, certainly not to the extent that Barry understands it. Um, I'm familiar with John Sella's older ontology, which I've seen cited in a lot of places, but I've never seen the Wilkins one is the first time I've seen that. But all of these things seem to be denotationally defined and derived from a mental model that is rooted in set theory. And there is a fundamentally big difference between the logic of set theory and the logic of the continuum, which is vector space theory. Those logics are not at all the same. And so I would wonder uh, that if we were to combine uh, a uh, and this would require some work, uh, perhaps there is an avenue in revising a viewpoint of uh, BFO or any ontology in terms of the logic of vector spaces. And vector spaces is what's used in quantum logic and quantum theory. And these are uh, disruptive today, much as the original relativistic field theory was developed by Einstein disrupted the Newtonian worldview. So, um, so now to my questions: uh, Is there, and, and you mentioned you, you, would, you would get to this, is there a way to measure the quality of one top ontology as preferable over another top ontology? That was my first question. Um, so over to you, or even both of you. It doesn't really matter who throws the answer. Uh, maybe Barry first. Yeah, so I think that the way to, that, that there is a, a vector of uh, quality measures for ontologies, and I think the most important one is the number of users. And the reason why this is so important is the same reason that number of users is important for a telephone network. Uh, if you have a fantastic telephone network made of golden cables that, uh, that is, uh, from an engineering point of view, the, the best thing John Sower has ever seen, if you don't have any subscribers, if no one is using your network, then you have nothing. And all of the other quality or utility markers for ontologies follow from that. So a, a, a good quality ontology has to have good documentation addressed both to 
uh, users who are not trained in ontology technology and to ontologists who need to help, for instance, apply the ontology to other do domains and so on and so forth. So having uh, uh, large numbers of users who are aggressively applying the ontology and pr providing feedback to the editors of the ontology so that it can be improved over time, these are, for me, the prime marks of quality of an ontology. So it's a social metric, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're, not we're not building these things for aesthetic reasons. Okay, I uh, let me agree with Barry because I claim that Barry's ontology, VFO, is a special case of the uh, Perth Wilkins ontology, which I have presented. And the point that I make is that his version of theory, his version of physics, is a special case of a more general uh, version of physics that makes the process fundamental and uh, the uh, distinction between an, an object is simply a special case of a process. Now, that will fit very nicely. Barry's system can fit very nicely into that framework. And he wishes to make the distinction of uh, the continuum and, and, uh, and uh, it, it is something that fits in uh, calling a uh, calling an object a continuum simply means that for observation by a human being for a particular purpose, uh, the changes are slow enough that you can continue that you can recognize the same object at multiple times. Therefore, you can uh, call it a uh, an object. So, an object is an approximation. Unfortunately, John, you can't have it both ways. So that you can't, you can't claim that VFO is, is just a special case of your Perse Wilkins artifact, and therefore your Perse Wilkins artifact has, in effect, all the users that VFO has, and then oh, wow. define and then define continuant in a way which contradicts the way continuant is defined in VFO. There is uh, you you no, can't have it both ways, if, particularly not if no you accept the importance of formal I definition. See, I define VFO as a special case. Namely, it is a way that takes a vague, an underspecified ontology and makes it precise for a particular application or set of applications. So and, thereby, and thereby useful. No, no, it's useful for an application. So I'm saying it's, that... It, but it's useful in the, in the technical sense I define, namely it has a large number of users. Oh, yeah, so your Perse exactly. Wilkins ontology, I predict will, in five years' time, still have zero users. Oh, it has every, I claim that every use of VFO is an approximation to the universal ontology. I'll, I'll, I'll call, I was calling it the first place, uh, first uh, Wittgenstein. I can add the first, um, first uh, Wilkins ontology, but two of my other favorite on, uh, philosophers are Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein, and Whitehead. And so why don't I just call it PWWW, PWQ. And the PWQ ontology has processes as fundamental. This is completely consistent with uh, quantum mechanics. And Newtonian mechanics is just an approximation to uh, quantum mechanics for uh, the things at the normal mid-level. And so when I say that you need a multiplicity of incompatible, inconsistent micro theories, that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, Syke has. Syke has, as we at last found out, uh, heard, is 6,000 different micro theories, many of which were uh, contradictory to one another. There is no problem in having them contradictory because you, they're all organized in a very nice lattice, and if there are two of them, two uh, ontologies that contradict one another, you simply go up to a higher node in the lattice in which the contradictory parts are thrown away, and they agree on the part that, uh, and there's that uh, intersection on which they agree. And that is the way interoperability operates. People who have totally different uh, details can always interchange information at the upper level. For example, you might have a totally different de definition of what is a human being when you get all down to the nitty gritty, but at the point where all you're concerned about is name, address, serial number, or a social security number, those issues are things that everybody can agree on, whether you call a person a process or you call a person a, an object. A person may be an object for one way, but 
the most definitely a person in the process, and this is the point uh, Whitehead said, that uh, there is an identity of an individual from birth to the death. On the other hand, that person at various stages uh, may have no resemblance or very little resemblance to the stage in, or earlier or later. And uh, uh, all of our atoms and, uh, um, are being inter-exchanged constantly, and after a period of about 30 years or so, it's a nearly a total uh, re uh, replacement of all of our matter that's been contained in us, yet we're still the same person from the point of view of legal purposes and the name and uh, address and uh, so uh, social security number. So when you do science, John, you're concerned to be consistent with the way other people do science. And if somebody came along with a bunch of micro theories which were inconsistent with each other, each one for a different bit of biology, no biologist would use it precisely because they are inconsistent. No, it's hard it's work. It's hard That's work. Biology. And every other so time, why, why, then, why then does no one in biology use sight? Because the only thing that they have been that have been blasted into their head is BFO, and what I'm trying to say is BFO is useful. Don't throw it away. On the other hand, we have to step to a broader level in which BFO is treated the way it should be. It's one and we, micro theory. If, if we have the some, other. if we have something which is use, useful and is being used and does no harm, as you say. Why should they take the risk of jumping up to your Perse Wilkins universal best ontology? Because I don't see any need, and it sounds to me like uh, airy fairy philosophizing, which I hate. Then they can go into a broader framework in which they can relate not just biology, but they can relate the medical medicine. They can relate. No, all no, no. I, I, it doesn't work. It doesn't. Else. It doesn't work for that. I have been involved in a project where they. Tr tr tried precisely to do what you just said okay. with sight, this, and it didn't yeah, work, it didn't work. You're talking so, about something you don't understand because you're dealing with one fixed ontology, and the point is that when you talk about the full range, you're going to get into this immense number of issues that you cannot fit in force into BFO. Yes, yes, John. Calm down. Cover this very well. Uh, we have a few more. We have a question from the lobby. Rowdy, right. you had your hand up. I'm not sure you see the turn taking it down. I have a I am now on okay. Uh, I I I would like to know whether this synthesis is correct that while one is drilling down into specifics of a very wide but still a domain area of health and biology and uh, bi genomic, uh, genomic research. The other is describing uh, in our communicate sense the context, uh, the context of meta level reasoning and logic and meta level description of uh, what the context might mean in narrative or other um, ontology or text discussions. So, any comments on that? I think that John does tend to focus more on the meta level rather than on the level where people are actually using ontologies to do things. Wait, uh, I mean. I missed that point. What, what was the point about people are using what ontology to do what? I was not clear about what exactly they were so using. So, are you, are you wanting me to repeat what I said or Ravi? Uh, it's either one. I'm not certain what either okay. one of you is. No, I, so I would uh, like uh, Barry's comment. What? My comment is that I do indeed believe that John tends to emphasize the meta level uh, and that he tends there, thereby to underemphasize the object level where people are using ontologies to do useful things. Yeah, I, I, I was saying that I emphasize the meta, that contextual reasoning is a meta level reasoning in which you select which kind of information is relevant 
to the particular sentence. So when you have a particular sentence in a document, you use a meta level kind of reasoning for saying which sentences that surround that text are uh, part of the uh, in, of, uh, part of the current information that you're using to understand that text. And then what other background knowledge and whatever the surrounding sort of situational knowledge, you want to bring in all of that background knowledge and put it into the same working space. So your workspace that contains the, all of the axioms you're reasoning with at the moment will contain information from various sources. The, sen the sentence that you're talking about, the surrounding context in the document or the discourse, the uh, situation that is surrounding and the background knowledge, all of that information is gathered up by a meta-level process. The result of that meta-level process is a final uh, set of information in which you do the reasoning at the object level. So in other words, meta-level reasoning selects the information, puts it all in the same pot. In that pot, you do ordinary uh, logic. Okay, uh, Mike, you have a question? Sure. So I have a, a question or a challenge possibly for, for John. You're saying that continuum and occurrence are kind of on a continuum. And I'd like to challenge that. I'll explain why. And then I'll sort of briefly explain the background to why as well. Because to me, what, hang on, what's important is in, in the kind of ontology I'm interested in, how you conceptualize what is the concept. And I know this is very different to what Barry does with realism, but to me, important to define how the organizational entity carves up its world, what its concept is. And those two concepts are quite disjoint, even though the real things those concepts map to are indeed continuous. Yes, I completely agree. The context, the uh, distinction between a continuous and an occurrence, these are two disjoint ways of classifying things. But reality is continuous, and for any particular application, i.e. purpose, you choose to which one of those things happens to be appropriate for the time. So, for example, a glacier, if you look at a glacier at a short period of time, it's an object. If you think about a glacier over a long period of time, it's flowing in the same way as a river would flow, and it's just a time scale difference of whether you want to call it a continuum or an occurrence. Right. So that had not been clear. You're, you're definitely saying that the ontology itself maps those things. Yes, I, I, that's a point that I made uh, Thank you. back in my uh, years ago. Okay. Do you have any comment on that? No. Okay. Uh, I I I think we understand as a collective body of what we can put in the communique about context and what uh, John and uh, Barry discussed today, uh, not necessarily the contentious part of their thinking, but at least two points of view of where uh, ontologies are going. But, but uh, that apart, uh, how do they differ in their definition of context? So I would like actually to add a third view which draws on what Mike uh, was, was just saying. So I believe that in addition to the real world context in which real human action and perception takes place and in which real human language understanding takes place, there are also various artificial worlds or worlds created out of information artifacts such as the world of uh, finance for instance. And there, I think, there are new kinds of continuance being created, ge generically dependent continuance in the sense of BFO. And these are quite interesting because they have a history in the sense that they are born and uh, they are created, in other words, at a certain point in time, and they may then be wound down at a later point in time. But they don't contain molecules as parts. So they are continued entities which belong to abstract realms, which determine all kinds of human activity um, in virtue of the fact that people buy them and sell them and, and uh, use them for all kinds of financing activities. Uh, but the, the type of context that we're dealing with now involves uh, very, very strange kinds of entities, which I, I believe that philosophers have thus far uh, neglected. And I think that one of the, one of the areas of BFO-based ontology, domain ontology work, is precisely in the area where 
documents and meet financial organizations to create new kinds of reality? Well, Mike, uh, uh, if I may please be allowed as an exception to, to just comment on what uh, Mike just said. I agree that the accounting and financial services have origins as far as back as the Abacus probably, and the single entry and double entry systems no, no, are go ahead. go ahead. But no, no. recently, the e commerce is what made automation possible in uh, financial services more meaningful in terms of documents and contracts that you are talking about, as well as about uh, FIBO, etc. So, uh, that is a special case of processes that institutions have agreed and have evolved a standard on. So context is to be viewed in terms of those services and products. Okay, thank you, Robbie. We still have a few more questions and comments, and we don't have much more time. Finance is an excellent example. Thanks. Where is an excellent example where there's activities among human beings who are pushing a lot of paper and pushing a lot of electrons around. They're also doing this about a subject which is a huge semiotic subject. And this, if you want to understand finance, you must classify that under semiotics as the uh, uh, sign representation. That is the, uh, that is the subject matter. And then there is the reality of what people are actually doing with this uh, money, which may refer to the economy and to what people are doing. There's a lot of references and so on, and that's why it's very important to make that sheer distinction. Now, the other point that uh, uh, Barry was talking about BFO, in which he was talking about uh, all these uh, things that he had information kinds of artifacts getting under the people and organisms and so on. This is another excellent reason why you have to separate the signs and the reality, because all of that kind of thinking and purpose and all that belongs under the semiotic side of things, which has a very close relationship to understanding what these, uh, why, what and why and how all these people are doing these th and organisms are doing things on the uh, physical side. And the answer, once, if, I want, if you want to get a very short answer of how do the signs differ the answer is to look at the three basic questions. A what, a why, what, how, and why. What and how is physics. Why is always semiotic. And that is always where you deal with the purpose and the goal and the intention. Every one of those things is a semiotic process and that explains what is going on and how it's working. You have to answer the question why. You, that's when you go to the semiotic side. Okay, I think uh, who is first here? Corey? Or I have Corey? a short question. Um, how, how, and this is a question for both uh, Barry and John. My question is um, about ontology evolution. I mean, it's clear that 100,000 years ago, our ontologies were very primitive, and if we ossified around those ontologies, we would make zero progress. So, uh, in looking at ontologies um, and making the claim that one ontology is the best ontology, um, I would like to understand um, what um, what is your viewpoint on ontology evolution? Good. So, um, first of all, BFO has evolved quite slowly, but then it's also quite small. So, uh, you wouldn't expect it to uh, make rapid strides. Although, as I indicated in the, uh, in the response to John, uh, we do have quite specific target um, additions to BFO, uh, primarily in the area of physics, but also in the area of legal and um, uh, deontic phenomena, such as permissions and rights and licenses and so forth. Um, now, I think the main lesson to be learned from the success of BFO-based ontology development, in, particularly in the biological world, is that if you have large numbers of people using an ontology framework, then there is accumulation of knowledge on the part of those people so that the framework becomes better. The, the teaching tools become more sophisticated. The number of people who are 
uh, familiar with the principles which need to be applied becomes larger, and so they can help other people to apply them more correctly. And also, most importantly, the ontologies themselves become better because if you have multiple users, then they find errors, and then you have the opportunity to correct the errors, and then the ontology gets better because of those corrections. And the gene ontology is now much larger than it was when it was first created, precisely because all of those thousands of users of the gene ontology are confronting real data about biological phenomena on a daily basis. And when they can't find a correct, correctly defined gene ontology term for a given phenomenon, then they will request from the editors that a corresponding term be added to the ontology. And this is another argument why users, having lots and lots of users, is an indispensable criterion for having a, an ontology which is not only good, but also evolving into something which is even better. Uh, so something like the Peirce Wilkins ontology that John described will only be able to evolve into something better as soon as he's able to recruit even one user. Um, and I still am making the bet that in five years' time, he will not have recruited even one user. One, first of all, it's uh, just something that I cooked up uh, just very recently. I originally only had Wilkins. And it's only but, but John, you said it was the best ontology you'd ever seen. Yes. So you can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't make the excuse that it was just something you cooked up a few minutes ago and then say the best ontology you've ever seen. I am saying that I include everybody's ontology under it, and everything that you have said about VFO fits perfectly, beautifully into uh, this ontology as a special case, as an approximation to this. Now, the point is that uh, what I'm uh, I, I agree that I have to uh, take those labels and show precisely how they map into very nice, formally defined uh, top level. I also point, however, that BFO has a huge amount of users that has added a lot of what one might call encrustation that it does not belong where it does. The information artifact ontology, all that information about uh, affordances and so on, those are all information things that belong on the left-hand side, anything that deals with information, anything that deals with signs, anything that deals with the paper shuffling, with the uh, electron shuffling in a data computer, all of that is semiotic, all of that belongs on the left-hand side. Okay, and, then, so uh, in, other mean, words, in other words, you agree that the BFO, IAO, and so forth are not, in fact, specializations of your Perth Wilkins uh, universal best ontology. It's I because that we put the things on the wrong side. So it's, Every you, ontology is an approximation, and if it's not an approximation, then it is extremely brittle, and it cannot be used for more than but one teeny, weeny, tiny application. B, BFO has existed now for 14 years, and it's, hard, it's changed and, hardly at all. The gene and, ontology has existed for 20 years. It's and, been uh, used by thousands of people, and it's not brittle. It's not irrelevant. It's totally so you irrelevant. say all ontologies of type X. Yes. I think we covered this enough. Something <laughs> <laughs> we don't want the room to start, to start on fire. Okay. Uh, it's a little scary. You want to take a chance on this? I'll, I'll, I'll take a chance. I'm listening to these two towers of the industry. And, uh, just counting the, the three of motion, uh, trying to figure out what the, the essential points of difference are here. Uh, and I, I'd like, you know, to, to see if there are, if we can distill those essential points of difference. Um, I heard a couple of things. One from Barry that his top level was essentially reverse engineered from scientific principles. I believe that something along those lines. Whereas John tends to um, start more with the, the, the philosophy. And, and there was this uh, uh, comment just a few minutes ago that um, essentially John was kind of including the meta levels over the um, more specific uh, ontology of, of, of Barry. So 
it seems like something around this, 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 this area of the metal level and maybe very few upper level concepts are the essential difference. And so I'm, I'm wondering from, from both, if you could kind of just distill what you think is that essential difference and is what would be the mechanism for um, maybe coming up with a synthesis that would work? Either you, either you wish to... So, John, I think you should go first this time. Okay. I will summarize this point uh, in terms of what Kurt said. It's easy to be certain, one only has to be sufficiently vague. And in that sense, I'll replace the word vague with underspecified. And uh, I say that the PW cube, a purse, uh, uh, Wilson, the Whitehead, Wittgenstein, that version can be made stated precisely but underspecified in a way that will include site, which has been under uh, development for over 30 years and has a huge amount of work by very, very highly qualified people and a huge number of users. And that is probably the best, most uh, detailed developed ontology ever. And that is a special case of the uh, the PW2 ontology. And I would say that uh, the reason why CFO has a lot of applications is that the people who use it use it in a very weak, sloppy way. They take the words continuous and uh, occurrence and they just map them into their informal notion of what they call process and, uh, process and object. And there is none of the detailed precision supposedly in BFO that is really used in the gene ontology or anything else. And all the successes are due to the fact that Barry has successfully been educating people on how to use logic in order to define their terms. And I, I give him full credit for that, no question. But I don't claim that BFO deserves to be called anything more than a special purpose micro theory. I don't think we're actually addressing Corey's no. comment. But, but what's the so, so? What's the synthesis? What can you repeat synthesis? the the last? Can you repeat the last question? What's, what? I, I, I was I was asking for the, the, the you know kind of the essential difference in a pragmatic practical way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I can state the essential difference. Of, yeah. What, what's the what's the real difference? And what's the and, and, and yeah. So. I think that the, the, the real difference can be captured in what the gene ontology uh, calls the true path rule. The true path rule says that given any term at any point in an ontology tree, any instance of that term has to be an instance of a parent and of a grandparent and so on until you get to the root node of the ontology. So there has to be a true path all the way. I totally agree. I agree. Yeah, so with let me finish. Let me finish. Now, in order to get a true multiple ontologies, uh, it's quite difficult. So if you want to say that a given ontology, say the Peirce Wilkins cubed ontology, is higher up the tree than another ontology, say BFO, then you have to provide a true path connecting the lower to the higher. I, 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 John, I John, John doesn't tend to do that detailed I work. I will do that. I will do that. I will he, do that. He loses his temper instead. And so that's that. the difference. That's the difference. I will do that. Okay. Okay, I'll come that. back in five years and see if you did it. I'll do that tomorrow. All right. I think we've, okay, we've addressed that. And uh, we've run out of time. And so I'd like to thank both of our debaters. Um, I think that we've, we've really covered a lot of ground, uh, published a great deal in terms of uh, elucidating the issues. And um, so I want to thank both of you. John, appreciate you being here. Mary, appreciate your, your time. And I'd like to thank John and all the participants in the discussion. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
but I, I uh, don't think this large. Yeah. 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 Yeah.